says, meet your neighbors. Because if you were coming down 135 from Framingham through Ashland, in Ashland, there's a road that goes off to the right, and it's called Franklin Road. And on that road was a great estate built in 1750 by Sir Henry Franklin. He lived there with his mistress, later his wife, Lady Franklin. She started out as a scullery maid, but they eventually got married. And it was a beautiful estate with orchards and flower gardens and slaves to take care of the orchards and the flower gardens. There was one slave, a, a girl named Dinah, and she had four children. Now, um, who was the father of her children? Well, I've sort of poked around, and I believe I was told a minister named George Stimson. So her youngest son was named Richard, Richard Potter, and he became America's first black celebrity. He became first a tumbler. He was taught by many Europeans how to do all sorts of tricks. And second, he was taught sleight of hand, so he was a magician. And third, the Rainey brothers, John and James from Scotland, taught him the secret art of ventriloquism. And he traveled all up and down the East Coast, up into Canada, all the way down to the south to part of Florida, and this is a story that was told about an adventure in Alabama. He'd been performing in the upper hall with his sleight of hand. And then he came down to the dining room and sat down at a table. And they said, no, no, you can't sit here. Just get back to the kitchen. So he was very polite. And he stood in the kitchen, the door to the kitchen. And they brought out a stuffed pig, a beautiful roast pig with an apple in its mouth. And as was the custom, the host took out an elaborate carving knife and began to carve the pig. And suddenly, the pig began to squeal and cry out and emptied the dining room. <laughs> so Mr. Potter did find a chair and a meal to eat. <laughs> and that's just one of the mysterious tales of Richard Potter, who ended up in Potter Place in Andover, New Hampshire, America's first black celebrity from 1803 to 1833. Uh, a little public service announcement, just so people know my health is perfectly fine. Has anybody seen fivewishes.org? It's a website that you go in and you fill out what you want to do for your end of life stuff and how you want to have, you know, do you want to have life support? Do you not want life support under what conditions? And look at it. And my brother said, do you have cancer? I said, no, I don't have cancer. But I'm trying to think of this now. Hopefully I get 20 or 30 years. You don't know. But you look at it and what you want for a memorial service and stuff. But it's just, it's interesting to think about that. So fivewishes.org. And... When Dylan was talking about walking across America, I had rode my bicycle from Oregon to Virginia in 1979. And I didn't know if I could do it or not, but when I did that trip, suddenly, when I finished, it gave me courage to do other stuff, so that when I decided in 1990 that I wanted to be a storyteller, I wanted to try to be a storyteller full time, you know, Ray Bradbury says all the time, we jump off the cliff and we grow our wings on the way down. And I, you know, you go ahead and do that. You talk about the universe and looking at it and seeing what happens. So rolling with that. Uh, I thought, too, just thinking of different things that people were saying. Many years ago in Salem, Mass., they had a Harry Potter conference. And I thought that it would be fun to contact them and say, would you like to have ghost stories? And they said yes. And then they asked me, would you like to be the head of Gryffindor House? And I said, absolutely. And they gave me this huge red robe, and it had this red cape, and it had these big red sleeves. And I got done with my duties on a Saturday, and my friend had a birthday party in Salem. And I thought, I'm going to have some fun. So I left my Harry Potter robe on. I go to her birthday party thinking, I'm going to get a rise out of these people. I walk in, and she says, oh, hi, Tony. Beer's in the fridge. <laughs> Nobody said anything. I walk into the kitchen. I'm over there, and there's a mother that I didn't know that had a three-year-old son. I get my beer, 
And the son just kept looking at me and looking at me. And finally he says, are you God? <laughs> and I started laughing for one second. I almost said yes. But I thought the poor kid would be in therapy for the rest of his life. But I just said, no, no, I'm just a little storyteller playing the head of Gryffindor House. And his mother started laughing and said, in their church, they had that picture that Michelangelo did of Adam and God. And God's in his white robe, but for God, on his Saturday night robe, that must have been a red one. <laughs> and when I was just thinking about everything going on here today, the whole thing with Rwanda, I changed my mind about 106 times on what little story I wanted to share. The cowtail switch is the one I landed on. A long, long time ago, in Africa, there was a man, he was a hunter, and he went out every day and he would hunt. And he had six sons at home, and his six sons would watch their father go off, and one day, their father didn't come back. And his wife was pregnant with the seventh son, and when that seventh son was born, and when that seventh son, Polly, was able to talk, he said, where's father? And the other son said, I don't know, he didn't come back. So they went out looking, and they found his spear, and they found his bones, and they found a leopard, the skeleton there beside him. And then they knew that he had died in hunting, but the oldest son said, I have the power to put the bones back together. And he did. And the next son said, oh, I can put the muscle on the bones. And he did. And the next son said, oh, I can give the skin. And the next one said, oh, I can give the power of breath. Oh, I can give sight. And they were there, and their father came back to life. And the people in the village looked at him and said, you've come back, wonderful. And they had a huge feast, and he took the cowtail switch, which was the most sacred thing in their village, and he said, which of my sons should I give this cowtail switch to? And the villagers were arguing, the one who gave you breath, the one who gave you skin, no. And he said, oh no, I should give it to my youngest son, Polly, for he was the one who said, where is father? And if he had not done that, I wouldn't have been brought back. And they say that a person's never really dead unless they're forgotten. That's for all the folks in Rwanda. Thank you to them. Uh, Cheryl wanted me to read a limerick, which is at the uh, which is in, inscribed on a granite wall in Edmonds Park. So I'm going to start with the limerick. Then I'm going to read. A, a, a slightly longer little tale. The limerick is called Cold October. Cold October made four hairy bees soporifically lie at their ease, each apparently dead on a thistle stem head until warmed in the sun by degrees. <laughs> and that's that one. And that really happened. I went down a, a meadow uh, on a very frosty October morning and saw that very thing. The other is a little tale. I call it All Faction, which of course means sense of smell. All Faction. If I were a dog, I'd wave my nose low over the ground, a, cantilever, a cantilevered sensor. I'd snatch smell prints that emit amazing tales. The maze of tales would tantalize me. I'd see with my wolfish nose a pageant of errant waifs who'd left their whiffs for me, just me, to snort. Drugged on the sport, I'd have to choose which scent to chase. I follow the dander of a feral cat that spews its spicy scandals on the ground, a cat that scatters fragrant rumors through the grass. My chest is a drum as I race crisscross to the fence where Puss, that greasy cat, slides through a hole too small for me.
This piece is um, inspired from a, uh, a photo called After the Rain. It's part of Visual Inverse, which is a project we do in Plymouth every year. I'm part of the Poetry, the Art of Words group. So this is my poem. <clears throat> Ireland, a celebration of life. Here's to Ireland, to its enchanted castles and dramatic cliffs, giving way to splendorous seas, where restless rivers flow and magnificent waters fall. A people steeped in maritime tradition, respectful shepherds of the land, keepers of its majestic lighthouses. To the people that gave us Guinness, Jameson, and lively Irish pubs, as well as flavored, as well as flavored potato crisps and chocolate milk. Thank you for St. Patrick, the Blarney Stone, the Celtics, and a patriot or two. And for US President JFK and Israel's President Chaim Herzog. And for gender equality, hailing two of Ireland's female presidents. Thank you for designing the White House, the iconic Oscar statuette, and for Dublin's Nobel laureates, Bernard Shaw, Samuel Beckett, and William Yates. Thank you for shamrocks, rainbows, and pots of gold, and leprechauns and fairies with magic power. Thank you for Halloween, vampires, and St. Valentine as well as limericks, folklore, Bono, and you too. Thank you for the stethoscope, the syringe, and milk of magnesia. <laughs> for the submarine, the tractor, the steam turbine, for croquet, the greenhouse effect theory, and color photography. Thank you for great words like Donnybrook, boycott, bog, and bard as well as hooligan, kibosh, slogan, and smithereens. To Ireland, thank you for the Celtic harp, your national symbol, that still reflects its mortality of the soul. To Ireland, may your ancestors never be forgotten, your children always be blessed, who, with a little luck, carry enough love and celebration to fill a lifetime. Shana Betha to life. Shana Betha, to life, to Ireland. This piece is called News at the 11th Hour. My father may not have hated baseball, but being a farmer and a practical man, he had no use for it. What he did have use for was the Channel 4 Eyewitness News at 11 o'clock or more precisely, its nightly weather report. Since he was his own boss and had no one else to tell him what to do, he relied on Don Kent, TV meteorologist, to help him decide his work schedule for the following day. A forecast of rain meeting the difference between a morning spent grating eggs in the basement and one out in the field picking sweet corn or tomatoes. Every night, my father would turn on our black and white set in the living room a few minutes before primetime programming ended and settle into his favorite comfy chair, waiting for his sacred local news to begin. But seemingly, as often as not, instead on the screen, there'd be some athletic event going long extending into overtime, and my father would slam the side of the chair with a callous palm and mutter, damn ball game, damn ball game. He referred to every sport as that damn ball game. Tennis, golf, even hockey. But baseball was always the worst offender. In theory, Baseball can last for an eternity, a game easily stretching from the standard nine into endless innings. Another man might have simply changed the channel, but he was too loyal to Don Kent. <laughs> Not trusting those idiot weathermen with their coiffured hair and $100 suits on channel five and seven. 
So he sat there, his frustration mounting as the wall clock ticked past midnight. And then, just when he thought it was all mercifully coming to an end with the Red Sox down by three at the bottom of the 12th, some Boston slugger like Yaz, Carlton Fisk, or Fred Lynn would smack a homer out of Fenway Park and tie it all up. An hour later, the Boston Red Sox would defeat the Yankees, the Orioles, the Twins, or whoever was their opponent that night, and my dad as well, who robbed of that essential weather report, had long switched off the television, all the lights, and warily dragged himself off to bed to sleep the remaining dwindling hours before he had to rise at dawn, a chorus of damn ball game, damn ball game, echoing throughout the darkened house. Thank you. I'm a Vietnam veteran, if you haven't noticed by my hat. Um, it's taken me 50 years to uh, sit down and actually write something about my experiences in Vietnam. Uh, since I started, I, it took me the better part of a year to write this book, and I've finally come to terms with myself and was able to forgive myself for a lot of things that I did. I was uh, just 19 when I arrived in, in Vietnam, and I was taken out of the Navy and put in the Marine Corps, and I and, uh, was a crew chief on a helicopter in a squadron called the, the Hounds of Hell. What we did was high-risk rescue, and uh, much of which was done at night without the aid of night vision. It hadn't been invented yet. Um, the title of the poem is called Because This Is Who We Were. The wings of angels soar above in green helicopters, and the hounds of hell bark. The rotors thump, and out of the clouds comes death, and death is, death's name is mine. Reward comes with risk that we once took. And there is no winning if you cling to safety. When war becomes personal, there is no compromise for whom the dice roll. God's damned pay the price on both sides, and the only thing conditional is living and dying and loading and reloading, and not much changes in the face of war. We cannot forget because we are the only ones who know what we weren't. The hounds are restless tonight, and I come in their name, for I am the third horseman. Cloak and cloaked in black, and death is my name. Thank you. This one's called Six Months from Never. Six months ago, I asked if you would like to go out sometime. You said never. <laughs> One month after, we saw each other at a friend's Thanksgiving party. We played cards against humanity. Two months after, another friend threw a New Year's party. We sang Auld Lang Syne standing next to each other. Three months after, we were at the same hotel for different reasons. We met in the workout room. Four months after, we both went to an anti-Valentine's Day meetup. We exchanged platonic cookies. Five months after, we both happened to be at the park on the first day of spring. Neither of us have a dog. It is six months after, there is a gaming convention we both will go to. If we play in the same game, I will ask if you would like to go out sometime. If you say never, I will know you are serious. <laughs>
were looking for those fields of gold So many just found shifting sands Only the desperate hands could hold Gathering things we carried them Sometimes in the dead of night Heavy hand, cruel fist Unjust deeds We left them far from sight We could not forget them We could not forget our hopes Could never forget those places All the countries that we once came from We came from many foreign lands Sing We were looking for the streets of gold So many just found shifting sands Only the desperate hands could hold Old photographs are priceless Recollections so sublime This place is now my home The countries that we once came from We remember when we're alone From many foreign lands We were looking for the streets of gold So many just found shifting sands Only the desperate hands could hold Only the desperate hands could hold Thank you. Thank uh, you. The name of this poem is Twilight. A symphony of sounds. Dew blankets the earth. Moon gently rising. Sun slowly sinking. Evening shadows emerge. Animals return to their resting places. People gather round. Today's web has been spun. Thank you. It's sort of appropriate that this is a, uh, to some, a large extent, a uh, poetry venue because that's how I started. Uh, writing poetry back in fourth grade, and by the time I got to seventh grade, I figured it'd be great to put these poems to music. So I got a cheap guitar from a, a store no longer in business in the Bronx, and uh, or taught myself how to play guitar. Never put a single poem to music. I always found myself the music being first. Uh, this song here, I kind of wrote as an answer to a question from a friend of mine named Susan. Uh, and it's called Shaky Ground. I hope you like it. Wow. Sorry about that. Funny, but life is just as tough For those who aren't brave enough To step outside and take a chance 
Yeah, sometimes you fall, but sometimes you dance. Suffering with the status quo and calling it safer than the devil you don't know. It's like saying you were justified for just doing nothing while you watch your dreams die. You say you feel you're on shaky ground, afraid your whole world will all fall down. Take the chance, take the dare. Let the ground crumble while you float in air. Dreams are magic, they can never grow old, but to make them come true, you've got to be bold. Sometimes you gotta be a miner for a heart of gold that's buried beneath the shaky ground. A lot of folks like to give advice, sometimes it be bossy, sometimes it be nice. Either way, remember to always think twice, because it's your heart as you pay in the price. Learn to hear the whisperings of your heart, so you can tell your dreams from others apart. And if you find a friend with dreams you share, hold on tight and handle their hearts with care. You say you feel you're on shaky ground, afraid your whole world will all fall down. Take the chance, take the dare, let the ground crumble while you float in air. Dreams are magic, they can never grow old, but to make them come true, you've got to be bold. You've got to be a miner for a heart of gold that's buried beneath the shaky ground. Dreams are magic, they can never grow old, but to make them come true, you've got to be bold. Sometimes you gotta be a miner for a heart of gold that's buried beneath a shaky ground. Thank you very much.